To say that storm has powers is like saying nuclear explosions are warm. Aurora Monroe is more than a mutant. She is a literal force of nature, a goddess of lightning and thunder and rain. A descendant of sorcerers marked by white hair, in Wakanda they call her Hadari Yao, walker of clouds, for she wields elemental ability. Like Magneto's communion with metal, storm is wind, rain, and lightning. To some, she is a queen. To others, she's a goddess. We are just lucky that Storm is so benevolent. Welcome to another episode of Painting Marvel Anatomy. In this series, I take you behind the scenes and do my best to educate in the ways of art and world building. This series represents my attempt to demystify the art process and illuminate my journey in the hopes that doing so will help you with yours. Today, we're painting the mutant Storm. There are many reasons to choose Storm. She's amazing. She can fly, she can control the wind, she can summon pouring rain and pelting ice, and she can call down lightning, a deadly precision force that moves 30,000 times faster than a bullet and strikes with a temperature five times hotter than the sun. She unbalances the game. It goes rock, paper, scissors, storm. It doesn't matter who you're facing. You want her on your team. Today, we'll turn back the clock to the decade of my birth, the 1980s, and we're going to reference Mohawk Storm. More on that in a bit. Okay, so it doesn't take me too long to finish the thumbnail for this pose. I'm rendering her in profile. The emphasis here is on length and curves. I want lightning to flow from the sky into her body, and I want her to redirect that lightning with her outthrust arm. Her pose, which is basically the entire composition, should serve to emphasize that flow. Even her mohawk will ultimately point in the direction of her arm. Her eyes will be cold and white as ice, her lips pursed in anger and focus, and her bones will crackle and flow with electricity, like on a plasma lamp. Sounds pretty cool. All right, let's do it. Let's ink it. The human skeleton is an incredible machine. It helps you to sit, stand, walk, twist, and bend. Your spine consists of 33 bones, and with the help of a little yoga, you can become very flexible indeed. You have as many bones in your neck as a giraffe. Your ribs are flexible and protective, a housing for some of the most important organs in the body and a structural support system for the musculature of that body. Bones are beautiful. Storm is regal, which means she carries herself like royalty, chest out and shoulders back. Her spine should reflect this, so I'll draw it with a supple, powerful curve. I'll be taking the time I need to get these bones right. Her skeleton is one of our iconic elements, after all, so we really have to stick the landing. I also start in early with that powerful arc of lightning. It's rare in these paintings that I get to incorporate a massive bar of electricity into the composition. Massive bars of electricity tend to draw the eye, which means I'll need the rest of the composition to sort of balance this out. To do this, I'll exaggerate the length of her arm to lend visual emphasis to the lightning. I will also focus on the story of the lightning how it sweeps into the composition from the unseen clouds above and strikes her back as if drawn there. The repeating threads of light flow into her body perpendicular to the spine. They shimmer across her rib cage, rise up like a baby dragon to mount her upraised arm. And then directed by talons of red hot bone, the light will join together like lasers on the Death Star to fire a single burning ray down on her enemies. At least that's what I'm going for. My emphasis here is on the creation of tight curves and dynamic straight lines, a feeling of strength and speed. I've drawn her skeleton right up to her face. This is Storm Skeleton. It should look beautiful, not monstrous. So we'll focus on grace and the weaving of electricity and bone to carry the image. And on keeping the electricity thin, a single bolt of lightning can stretch for miles, but it's usually only two to three centimeters thick. I've kept the lightning line work thin too, since I still want it to read as light. All right. The inks are in a good place. And before we move on to the coloring, let's take a moment to appreciate our own skeletons, shall we? Wherever you are, take a moment to stand up and let's do these stretches as advised to me by my chiropractor, Dr. Wolf. Because you're sitting at your desk, you want to stand up to do the stretches because you're sitting and everything is all compressed and forward. So uh, one of the great things to do is to open your pecs up and your hand should be on the door jam at the same level as your shoulder and you pull and turn so you feel the stretch right here. And you shouldn't really stretch hard, you should just stretch it easy. And you hold it for the count of like five to 10, 
and then you do the other side. You pull and you turn and you feel the stretch here. Awesome stretch, all right? When you're at your desk, you roll forward and everything is short, so you wanna open it up. Another great stretch is to stretch your lats and your shoulder, because your shoulder's down all the time. So you wanna grab a wrist, pull up and over, so you feel the stretch here. One, two, three, four. And then the other side, one, two, three, four. Also a great stretch is to open your upper back. So you, a lot of people do this, but that's really bad for you because you jam your spine in, but you want to open everything up so you go forward like that. One, two, three, four. That's a great stretch. And another good one is to also stretch your arm this way. Good for stretching the back of the shoulder. One, two, three and one, two, three. And also stretching should be light and gentle. It shouldn't be hard. These are great for you. Okay, is that good? Let's sit down. Yes, I have a chiropractor. Dr. Wolf literally saved my career like six or seven years ago, but that's a story for another day. In the meantime, if you're enjoying this channel, if you're enjoying this video, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. Leave a comment too. I always want to hear from you. Storm first appeared in March 1975 in the so-called Bronze Age of comic books during the heyday of black exploitation films, and she was the first major female comic book character ever to be of African descent. To help make her more palatable to mainstream audiences, Storm was rendered with hair that was so impossibly long and flowing that she often used it to cover her nakedness. In short, she was an exotic fantasy woman. Eventually, though, Storm found a home with the X-Men. Here, she belonged. At Professor Xavier's school, young mutants could study and learn and find themselves in peace, safe from the bigotry of the world. Even in Kenya, her white hair and blue eyes made her different. The temptation for many in her position would be to try to blend in, to do everything you could to pass as acceptable in the eyes of the majority. Mohawks are not generally acceptable in the eyes of the majority. Mohawks are not traditionally beautiful. They are aggressive and sharp. In fact, the entire punk aesthetic is one that says, very simply, I don't give a what you think about me. By 1983, after a series of horrifying, eye-opening experiences, Aurora Munro, on a mission with the X-Men in Japan, shaved her famous mane and gave herself a mohawk. This decision was not merely aesthetic. It signaled that Storm was no longer as naive and forgiving as she used to be. She was becoming stronger and harder. She was a leader now, and she was done caring what anyone else thought of her. It was a powerful message and a powerful moment, and it immortalized Storm as one of the very first female badasses in comic books. And that's why I chose the Mohawk. Plus, she makes it look good. All right, so a couple of things. I was gonna go blue-white for the bones to give it a sort of x-ray effect, but I've decided to go with orange. Lightning is hot, and that orange hue makes the bones feel warm. It also works in harmony with the dark brown of her skin and provides a backdrop for her white eyes and blue-lit face to pop. I want the transition between her head and suit to be smooth so that it doesn't get in the way of her glowing orange skeleton. To do that, I paint a dark gradient on her skin. That gives me an opportunity to do a little sculpting and refinement in the face. I want to see anger and effort in the subtle lift of her lip. Then I add shadows into the roots of her hair to create a gradient for her mohawk and help that blend in a bit more. Once the fundamentals, her face and suit and hair are all taken care of, I turn my attention back to the lightning. I erase the inking lines and give it a subtle glow. I etch smaller tendrils of lightning between her bones and start making those bones glow wherever the lightning hits. I want her skeleton to shimmer, like when you're staring at a fire and watching the embers at the bottom flicker and flow with light. I go the extra mile on her fingers. I want those finger bones to look long and beautiful and as incandescent as candles. They'll also be the brightest parts of her bones to better showcase how she's focusing the light and directing it from her hand. From here, I refine. I refine everything. The bones, the teeth, the shading, the lightning. These are areas of focus for me and they're going to be the area of focus for the audience. 
I work on the vertebrae of the neck and I refine everything we can see of the skull behind her face. As I mentioned before, this should be creepy and fascinating, but not outright scary. So I'll keep the skin, bones, and electricity on the warm brown end of the spectrum and let the bluish light of her eyes and face take visual priority. This minimizes the horror effect and keeps the emphasis on her personality. I heighten the visual powers of a lightning by adding cores of white heat. I turn up the heat in the bones by painting some areas redder and brighter. I enhance and enhance and enhance. The last step, which I won't always show you, but I thought I'd show today, is to orient Storm on the page. I've got a loose layout by now of how the text will lie, so I use this as a backdrop to get her positioned just so. Then I paint in darkness around her. I'm not entirely certain that this is a great idea. It kind of muddies her silhouette a bit, but I do really need for that lightning to lift off the page, or else you won't really see it and you won't feel the power of all those volts. To make this look as good as possible, I sweep the darkness into a sort of shape around her, similar to the compositional movement of the lightning, diffuse at her back, then funnel down and intensify down the length of her arm into the lightning bolt. I try to give the suggestion of clouds, but I've just about run out of time on this work and I can't really start illustrating backgrounds now or I'll never finish this book. Again, I'm not sure if that darkness was the right call, but that's the call I've made. Before it's finished, I give her her little lightning earrings, very signature look, and with that, Storm is finished. Here's the thumbnail sketch. Here's the line work. And here's the final painted image. She looks good. I'm happy with how this turned out. I hope you are too. I guess we'll just have to see what the Marvel audience thinks of it. So what are we painting next? Well, after so long painting heroes, I think it's time we went for something a little bit more villainous, don't you think? Let's go with a toothy extraterrestrial that has a unique hatred of Spider-Man. Think you know who I'm talking about? Leave a message in the comments, tell me what you think. And don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. I wanna do a lot more of these, but whether or not I can is wholly dependent on you and your support. So thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day.